Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. Some of my favorite garden memories center around butterflies. But along with flowers for nectar, they need leaves to feed their young. In honor of Native Plant Week, Habitat Steward Meredith O'Reilly identifies caterpillars and their larval sources to attract a brood of butterflies. On tour, let's visit a wildlife haven at a house of two dreams. On a hill overlooking Lake Travis in Leander, Betty and Gerald Ronga built their house of two dreams. It was also the dream spot for Betty's garden visions, hampered by shade in their Austin home. She spent hours on Meditation Rock, designing the space where she could grow everything under the sun. But before she planted even one thing, she concentrated on travel patterns, water flow, and drainage. In the front, well, when we put the uh, courtyard in, we obviously, again, on rock, solid rock, and we had to figure out that he is the water diversion genius, you know, and so she looked at it all, and uh, I had some fellows come in and put a lot of dirt in, and she had them grading it and deciding how we were going to get the water to run off, and she graded it and had it run off kind of on each side of the main entrance with two little dry creek beds and had to put a hole in the courtyard wall to get out one side and through the gate on the other and it's, it's worked beautifully. Uh, so when it comes to routing water around, this is, <laughs> this is the lady you want. She thinks about that anytime she starts working on any gardening project, she's thinking about where the water's coming from and where it's going to go. The courtyard was inspired by their many trips to Mexico, starting on their honeymoon. We had spent so many years going to Mexico uh, and loving the country. In the summer, we put the Cuban or Mexican music on, get a couple of beers, and we're right here. <laughs> In back, the first job was to restore the view. The land was covered with cedar trees. The land was absolutely impassable. I'm not sure you could have reached this point without shimmying between cedars to get out to that rock. When we first saw it, we had no idea was what was out there. We didn't even know there was a view. Total cedar, thick with cedar. That's what the land was like when we got here. We left cedar as much as we could on the sidelines to keep the diversity of trees. Betty designed their pool to follow the lines of the distant, though depleted, Lake Travis. but the dolphin boulder was pure serendipity. Betty also designed a pond to bring wildlife right up close. A mound of rocks from the pool and pond excavation inspired an idea. Betty covered them with soil as an ever-changing frame of wildflowers. Betty's pathway design accounted for drainage along with wheelbarrow traffic. Instead of stairs, she terraced with sloping walkways that disperse water. Good quality landscape fabric underneath and bordering rocks keeps the soil in place. Thanks to water and plant diversity, rather than a singular crowd of ash junipers, that is restored wildlife diversity. It is an assault on your senses when you come out here. From the birds that are you know, constantly running back and forth. We get vultures here 
that will dive bomb along the slope of the roof and out over the pool and just put on a show in the evenings. Uh, the colors, especially on an overcast day after it just rained, are just, we pinch ourselves a lot. I mean, we've been here seven and a half years and we take nothing for granted. This is just a beautiful piece of property and Betty has transformed it into a Garden of Eden. For the kitchen, it's also a true Garden of Eden. She's got two huge plastic containers, and she will come in with stack to the top, say, okay, here you go. Oh <laughs> and, then she'll, and then she'll disappear and say, oh, don't, one, all I want is one. I don't want you to bring two. I'm cooking in there for two hours trying to get the, <laughs> and we freeze them, cook them lightly so they're still, you know, just blanched kind of thing, and then get them in the freezer bags and put them in the freezer and freeze them, and we've got, I don't know, a do still a dozen, 14 bags of meals and meals of greens that uh, just thaw out and have fresh organic greens. It's great, it is great, but it's, I, you know, one pot at a time, dear. <laughs> one pot at a time. One of her techniques is recycling newspaper for many dams to concentrate water around her fruit trees. And in this house of two dreams, golf meets gardening. Well, early on, we decided that we were interested in golf and gardens. And I wasn't interested so much in the garden part. And so any vacation or trip we took had to involve uh, going to a garden, a botanical garden, a private garden, something, for every round of golf I wanted to play. <laughs> so on an early trip we took to Scotland, I got Betty to play around the golf with me and then we took in a garden. We ended up going to a place called Inverview Gardens in the very north up uh, above Gerlach, Scotland that I just, it, it was the moment, you know, there's, I guess everybody has a moment where they decide instead of trudging along, like take me to a mall, I'm not interested, I'm tired immediately. <laughs> Let me walk six miles on a golf course carrying my bag as long as I'm hitting a white ball, no problem, <laughs> I'm okay. But we went to this garden and it was acres and acres of things and I just fell in love with it. That day long ago prompted their garden putting green. I now have the best of both worlds, golf and gardens. <laughs> Collaboration on dreams makes them come true. Wrangling them to reality can be another story, but it's just part of what really makes a house of two dreams. Mexico and Latin America were the inspiration for the house and the design. When we started, we were dreaming. And when we started? When we were building, nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> when we started, we were dreaming, right? We could put another sign right next to it. <laughs> Now that's a spectacular, spectacular garden. Beautiful lakeside views and a terrific plan. Thank you so much for opening your garden gates for Central Texas Gardener. Now we're gonna be talking about a critical part of the ecosystem that really kind of grosses a lot of people out, but is something that really is important for you. And those are the caterpillars of all those beautiful butterflies and moths. And we have Meredith O'Reilly from the National Wildlife Federation who's joining us now to help us identify the good guys out there in the garden. <laughs> and uh, I said creep them out. They don't That's... creep me out. I love every one of them. <laughs> You're an exception to the rule, I think, <gasps> and in some ways. I think a lot of people <laughs> still have a hard time with the caterpillars, though they love the butterflies. Mm -hmm. They are beginning to appreciate the, the two really go hand in glove they, they, that they, they require, do. right? But uh, we're going to talk about great host plants for these guys, and mm -hmm. then we're also going to show people what the different uh, caterpillars look like, which is going to be very helpful for them. So uh, just start by talking about the fact that it, um, it is Native Plant Week. Yes, it is. And uh, the interrelationship of these guys is really critical for our native habitats. Absolutely. Um, you know, our native plants are key to a very healthy ecosystem, mm -hmm. and we need the biodiversity to uh, have that um, healthy population of all mm -hmm. kinds of wildlife. Right. 
And when we're talking, a lot of the plants that we're talking about are, are, are host plants, which are different than nectar providing plants. Yes, the caterpillar host plants are the plants that the butterfly and moths will lay their eggs on. And these are the plants that the caterpillars will eat. And uh, usually it's very, very specific. The butterflies will go around and, and land on a plant and um, test it. They'll taste it to see if it's the right plant for them to lay their eggs on. Mm -hmm. And those are the plants that the caterpillars will only eat. Uh, if, you, if you were to take a caterpillar off of its food source and take it to another plant, it likely will not be able to eat it and right. will either come crawling back looking for it or it's going to die. So right. it's important that you, you have these host plants that the caterpillars need. And as a gardener, it's important to uh, have forbearance for the caterpillars and let them do their eating. <laughs> Absolutely. You want these caterpillars to be here because mm -hmm. they are going to contribute to that healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a very, very uh, balanced diversity in your yard. And um, lots of animals rely on these caterpillars for food sources yeah. as well. So they're not just beautiful when they become butterflies and moths, mm -hmm. but uh, their role in the ecosystem is so right. very, very important. And Granted, some of them are pretty cool looking caterpillars too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now let's start off by talking about some of these different guys and we've brought in some uh, that are munching away over here and I recognize these immediately because they're on the passion vine which to me was the immediate tip off <laughs> that these are Gulf fritillaries. These are Gulf fritillaries, One yes. of our most common and beautiful butterflies. Mm -hmm. They're very common here and they munch on passion vine, um, the plants in the passion vine family. This mm -hmm. right here is actually um, may pop, which mm -hmm. is a purple passion flower, mm -hmm. but uh, there's, there's several different native passion right. vines in, in Texas. And uh, the Gulf fritillary butterfly, a smallish butterfly with beautiful orange coloration, and uh, these guys uh, you know, can get pretty thick on the passion vine. They can strip it down if you let them. We, yes, but the passion vine j just generally responds by, by growing again. Yeah, very and, tough plant. Uh, you know, in turn, if you have children or grandchildren, this is a fantastic plant to have because you'll be able to watch that life cycle, you know, repeatedly. You'll see yeah. chrysalises everywhere, and then you'll get to watch the butterflies emerge, yeah. and there's just nothing more special than you know, and, and you're right about this one and they're very prolific and you'll see chrysalises everywhere and so if you if you are good about checking mm -hmm. you'll you see a lot of the butterflies emerging which is very very cool and you're right also passion vine you don't need to worry about it coming back <laughs> <laughs> it's a monster in it, a lot well of this 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 one is this mm -hmm. one can be but um, if you plant it you know, in an appropriate spot, then mm -hmm. you can let it do its thing. Right. But those little spines on those caterpillars mm -hmm. are actually not harmful to yeah. people in this particular case. So, yeah. good, good uh, caterpillar to have in the garden. Okay, well, let's, another host plant is the Lindheimer senna. Now, mm. uh, what is the butterfly or moth that uh, prefers the senna? Well, different sulfur butterflies use it. I love uh, the sulfurs. They're yeah. so sweet. The sleepy orange is mm. a, a great one that mm -hmm. loves it. It has a little uh, green caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And some of the other sulfur uh, caterpillars will have some yellow mm -hmm. on them or different stripes. I and like stuff. The, the sound of the sleepy orange. <laughs> 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 you know, in Austin, Texas, we all can go with a little sleepy orange, I think. And uh, uh, the Lindheimer Senna is just a, a superb garden plant for it's, us. It is probably my favorite plant of the year. Oh, if I were really? to pick one, it's my personal favorite this drought year. Drought survivor, good. It's a drought survivor, but it's got the softest leaves. Have mm. you have you ever touched it? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it, uh, has a nickname. It's puppy dog ears, <laughs> and um, you go out there and it just just can't stop touching them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has this lovely little yellow bloom that mm -hmm. uh, blooms in uh, late fall, or right. sorry, late summer. Mm -hmm. All right, so the sulfurs and the sleepy oranges like the senna. Mm -hmm. Flame acanthus is another all-star plant for us here. And which, which uh, uh, caterpillar should we be on the lookout for here? The crimson patch caterpillar and butterfly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the flame acanthus is a great plant mm -hmm. because it's also a hummingbird favorite. Right. So, uh, and it's a very drought hardy plant. Uh, uh, yeah, I, we have one in my current garden. I haven't watered it this year. Yes, I haven't watered mine either. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe once or twice, but mm -hmm. it's been blooming like crazy, and the hummingbirds are going going uh, mm -hmm. crazy for it right now. And the uh, the butterfly there is the crimson patch, as you said, mm -hmm. and another lovely native species. Mm -hmm. 
And um, the little caterpillar has these tiny little black spines as well. But again, mm -hmm. just like the uh, Gulf Fritillary, they're not harmful to people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's meant to be a warning to those birds that might want to come down and, right. and munch on it. Right. Scare the, the predators off. Mm -hmm. Coral honeysuckle, which is another favorite native. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful flowers. A uh, uh, nice woody vine. Easy to control vine, too. I like this yes. thing about the coral honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those great sphinx moths uh, 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 is attracted to this one, right? The snowberry clear wing is um, a diurnal moth. That means it flies during the daytime, and people call it a hummingbird moth just because it kind of acts like a hummingbird going from flower to flower. Mm -hmm. Got the that, that long it, proboscis. The, <laughs> yes, it does. Very long. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful moth. Mm -hmm. But um, coral honeysuckle is also great because it's another hummingbird plant. And it has berries for the birds, mm -hmm. and um, it'll grow kind of dense, so the, sometimes you'll see birds nesting in it as well. All right. Uh, Mexican plum. I didn't know this was a host plant. It is. It's a host plant for the Cecropia moth. And this is a beautiful moth. It's the largest, I believe, in North America. And uh, it's, it's <coughs> simply incredible to look at. And, and the caterpillars will get large. Um, but the Mexican plum is its host plant. And it's also one of our earliest bloomers of the year, the beautiful white flowers that the bees will go looking for in the early spring. And, uh, and it has the fruit that will um, feed birds and mammals later on in the late summer. Yeah, I love Mexican plum, and the fragrance is heavy. Oh, yes, it's wonderful. It's a, one of my favorite uh, fragrances in all the garden. And another great Texas native is the wafer ash. It's an underutilized plant wafer ash and, and actually Mexican plum. They're both great understory uh, plants, understory trees, and uh, so they tolerate some shade. The wafer ash is the host plant for one of my personal favorite caterpillars, and it's the giant swallowtail caterpillar that um, may not be as attractive to some people as others because it uh, has a nice little camouflage. It looks like bird droppings, <laughs> but it's one of the uh, neatest things about it, I think. Uh, but wafer ash or a hop tree, some people call it hop tree, right. is its post plant. And the, the giant swallowtails are gorgeous. They're gorgeous. And they Beautiful. are, um, if not the largest, then they're one of the, the two largest butterflies in the North, in uh, the United States. So. Well, we only have a short time left, and we want to put a plug out there for the Austin Butterfly Forum. Mm -hmm. And they have a great website where people can learn about all about these different species, mm -hmm. uh, butterflies and the caterpillars, as well as the host plants, correct? Correct. All right, so austinbutterflyforum.org, is it right? It's actually austinbutterflies.org, okay. and the organization is Austin Butterfly Forum. Okay. And uh, great lists there for plants that you may be looking for. All right, well, Meredith, thanks so much for being our guest again, and uh, thanks to the butterflies <laughs> and the caterpillars as well. Coming up next, it's Daphne. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is about plant tags. Viewer Amy contacted us about some confusion and a large disparity between the label accompanying her crepe myrtle and the information that she found about the plant in her online research. The tag listed her crepe myrtle as growing 12 to 15 feet tall, but she found online sources that indicated a mature size of 25 to 30 feet. Well, as you might guess, this made a big difference to her. A 10 to 15 feet difference in plant size really changes where a plant should be placed in the landscape. Unfortunately, this problem is usually the rule, not the exception. You might even hear me give different information on a particular plant that you see on the label or from other sources. So which is right, the label or the research sources? This is where you really need to use your skills of logic and give some careful thought to the situation. First, try to see where the plant was produced and understand the climate of origin. Did the plant originate in Northern California, like many of our plants do? If so, the plant may get, a lar get larger in our lower elevation gardens where we have more warmth and sunlight. Another question to answer is, will you be able to give the plant ample water and space? That will also lead to a larger plant. Another area where the label often differs from your unique reality is in the planting instructions, such as full sun, sun versus shade. Full sun on a label very rarely means the type of full sun that is common in our summers but it might. So the best bet is to do a little research. If you can find someone with experience growing the plant in your climate, it will be better to trust that source than the label. 
Our plant this week is golden ball lead tree, Lucena retusa. Golden ball lead tree is a slender, shrubby plant which is usually trained to be a small tree. One of its many attractive qualities is that it's evergreen. I find that its wispy, light green divided leaves instill a sense of peace in a light breeze. It's quite a delicate specimen when compared to our more beefy trees, and it looks great in the garden if given a place all its own to stand out and be a focal point. It also looks lovely when accompanied by smaller shrubs as accents. Golden ball lead tree is covered in fragrant round yellow flowers from spring through summer. It normally stays around 15 feet tall and 5 to 10 feet wide. But depending on where it's planted and how much water and sunlight it receives, it may get up to 25 feet. It has an airy, billowy habit with small limbs that are easily broken in high winds. So this tree is best planted in a protected area, perhaps near your home or patio. It's also very drought and heat tolerant, requiring no to minimal supplemental irrigation. Augie's pet of the week comes from Dorsey and Susan at Hosbar Farms. Their two baby donkeys, Julian and Rose, are wonderful friends who also help in the gardens. They keep the pastures mowed, eat crop residues, and provide very high quality compost material in return. Thanks, Dorsey and Susan. To do in your garden this week, it's a great time to plant some cool weather loving herbs, such as chamomile, cilantro, and thyme. Those plants will do well for you all through the winter months and stay evergreen, giving you great source of herbs for your kitchen. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions, plants, or pets of the week. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. I don't always have as much time as I'd like to garden, so I find that having a really well-organized tool bag keeps me in the garden working and not running in back and forth for tools. I like a tool bag that's got a heavy fabric, so it's not going to be pierced by garden tools, but it's easy to clean and, and uh, holds up well to the elements. Now, a couple of things that I like to keep on hand um, are hose washers. The washers get brittle in cold weather. They uh, get soft in hot weather, and I keep hose washers in a film container so I can uh, repair a leaking hose end uh, real quickly with washers. I also have drip irrigation in many of my beds, so I keep emitters handy, a little container, so if I have a clogged emitter or something that needs to be changed, it's right there. I've also got my gloves for wet soil and my gloves that I use for pruning and heavier garden work. Got a water bottle in there and um, then I have, uh, I keep pantyhose legs. Those are great for tying up plants. They don't damage the stems. But I also like this uh, vinyl coated wire that's great for sealing up fertilizer bags or doing uh, repairs to trellises and fences in the garden. Got my uh, natural insect repellent also. And uh, folding pruning saw is handy. I like a pair of linesman's pliers in the bag because I can cut that vinyl coated wire or any other wire that I'm using in the garden. But I also use this flat side for pulling out oak sprouts or pecan sprouts that have a real deep taproot and can be difficult to get out of the soil. I also have a little notebook and pens for jotting down notes, things that I'm out of and need to purchase or just uh, make a to-do list for things that I need to accomplish. I also have some garden markers. I, I recycle stakes that I've had from previous plantings right on the other side with a Sharpie. And a wax pencil like this is great for writing on uh, plastic containers that you're planting. Uh, some seed envelopes or more of the metal containers for seeds. Um, keep my seaweed in the uh, container for in the bag ready to go. Any seeds that I'm gonna be planting go in a plastic bag. And uh, then I have my pruning shears, scissors, more plastic bags. Then I like to keep some spring clamps. These are great for holding row covers together. Um, my kneeling pad that uh, I use to protect my knees. I like to keep my garden twine in a little plastic container like this so I can pull out what I need and it doesn't get tangled. And my uh, trowel, my weeder, all of those kind of tools I have plenty of room for in here. And um, 
all of those things then make for a really wonderful uh, garden experience because I have everything right where I need. Now you can find tool totes like this and online. Uh, also hardware stores will have a good selection of tool totes. I also have another tool bag that I use just for hose repair, drip irrigation system installation. Um, I have all my hose repair couplings and pliers and all the tools I need. My uh, Here's my drip irrigation couplings and that's all ready to go. Anytime and have an irrigation issue, uh, I can grab this bag and take care of those things. So get organized with your garden and you will have a better garden experience. I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for joining me on Backyard Basics. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and to read our blog. Next week, Matt Turner looks at remarkable trees. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.